So, who would die for Marianne? That's a slightly more optimistic title than the one uh, provided on your presentations. I asked myself this question because a few days ago, I was watching a video of young French people who were asked, well, if France had to go to war, would you fight for France? All of them were saying no. So I thought, oh dear, if there's a third world war, we're going to need the Americans, again. <laughs> France used to have a glorious history of being this country of freedom at the forefront of identity and uh, the defense of individual liberty, as you can see it here. And the emblem for this was this figure of Marianne, so this woman with her Phrygian cap, leading people to its freedom. In 1790, more or less, this figure became emblematic of the new order of the Republic. The trouble is that nowadays, this figure is not the most unitive we have. And if we want to look at a moment when the history of France shows France being united again, it's when we win the World Cup. I was uh, 11 years old in uh, 1998, and that was a moment of great exhilaration and unity because all of a sudden, France appeared as that country where the white, the black, the Arabs would get together and achieve something great. And that was the kind of story that would bring people together and make everyone happy. Four years later, slight surprise, who comes in front of a very classic Gaullist, Jacques Chirac? We have Jean-Marie Le Pen, leader of the Front National. For my generation, Front National was the synonymous of uh, political hell. No one wanted the Front National. I remember the slogans, la jeunesse emmerde le Front National, forgive my French. So, why did all of a sudden France move from this? It's wonderful, we're doing things together, no matter if you're black, white, Arab, you are French and you will do great things here, to we need to stop these savages from destroying our country. One thing that happened is that the end of the Second World War and the end of the French colonial empire led to a need for reconstruction, so the cités were built to welcome the workers from North Africa and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa who were previously part of the colonies and who would be welcomed in France to contribute to the rebuilding of the nation. When these towers were built, they were considered peak modernity. It was great, it was this Le Corbusier ideal of the building responding perfectly to its function. So, your home is a square where you live, and we're going to provide you with lots of light, a bit of fresh air, the roads here so that you can go to work. And isn't this amazing? Yes, you'll even have some green spots here. Th that's great. So it wasn't a matter of excluding them or putting them apart. This was seen as progress. It was seen as social mobility. You live there, you spend a few years there, you gain enough wealth to move elsewhere, and then these buildings are available for the next generation to come in, start their family, and then they'd move on. It was a great idea, but what people forgot was that we are not Le Corbusier, we are not the sum of our functions, and whenever you reduce an individual to his functions, it's dehumanizing. So enters the recession of the 1980s, these buildings are now completely degraded, people do not have the social mobility to li live these places, and they feel stuck and trapped in a world that has no connection with the rest of French culture. Here, where are the libraries? Where are the museums? Where are the churches? No places that can bring people together because people who live there have been seen as workers or as tools. So, here is what the young people of the banlieue look like. Here they look pretty nice, you know, just chilling out, everything is fine. But this shows, you know, a majority of unemployed young men who do not have any grounding in the country where they live and build up a certain resentment. So I'm not planning to 
advocate or remove any kind of moral responsibility from them when they do something bad. But, you know, they feel stuck in France just for the reason explained here. Here I am, a North African woman in Sweden coming from an English university talking at you in English. If the world was perfect, I'd be talking to you in French, you know, like who are doing when, during the Société des Nations. But French is not a selling language anymore. France has zero soft power in comparison with the prestige it used to have, let's say, just 30 years ago. So, speak French, visit France, speak English, visit the world. If you speak the banlieue fr French, you can never ever leave that place. So, the banlieue problem is not so much an ethnic problem as it is a space segregation problem. If your postcode in France starts with 93, the employers won't like you. So, even if your name is Jean Dupont, if your reference is the banlieue culture, you have no social prospect. And this leads to that, the 2023 riots, the proof that there is a whole part of the youth in France that has no grounding in French history and continuity, and they don't belong in the place, and they don't want to belong in it. We used to have stories that we'd tell children to make them feel proud of being French. And here she is, Joan of Arc, who kicked out the English from, uh, from uh, Orléans and just managed to reinstall a king. That was a great, great feat. And we tell these stories of victory and we have the impression that, yes, some great things were done by French people in the past, even when they lost. If you lose to Caesar, it's not really losing, right? So <laughs> this is Vercingetorix surrendering to Caesar, throwing his weapons. He's been taking a prisoner to Rome, horrendous ending for him, but this illustrates a phrase that was the opening of many history books all across the French colonial empire, nos ancêtres les Gaulois, our ancestors the Gauls. This might seem ridiculous that, you know, someone from Congo, someone from Indochine could say nos ancêtres les Gaulois, but in fact there is something very logical about it, which is that from the moment you acquire French L literature, language, history, you are just as French as any other French person. No questions asked. And that is still the policy in France, insofar as if you are born on the French soil, educated in France, you're French. That's it. And it explains why French data is colorblind. We don't know exactly how many people are born from immigration and so on and so forth, because Everyone is French. So France doesn't really do multiculturalism in the way the UK or the US or Canada would do. It's just, you're French and that's it. This is explained by the complexity of France in and of itself. If you look at the details here, so um, when Joan of Arc intervened, she created the unity between this north of France, let's say butter and beer France, and this France, that's olive oil and wine France. And it was so important because, you know, until the very beginning of the 20th century, these people from Brittany didn't like the Normans, who didn't like the Picard, who didn't like the people from the East. Everyone disliked the Parisians. <laughs> and other point of tension, people here had more in common with the people here than with the people here. People here had more in common with people here, and so on and so forth. People here, no, they didn't have much in common with people there, no. So, Le Général, um, De Gaulle, <laughs> great man of French unity after the chaos of Second World War, during the war said something like, well, a country that has 350 cheeses cannot lose the war. Good. Uh, later, after the Americans and the British helped us out of quite a messy situation, he said, how is one supposed to govern a country that has 258 different cheeses? So you've noticed fewer cheeses, but more importantly, in France we don't say that diversity is our strength. Diversity is chaos, it creates complications, it creates a very difficult possibility of unity. So either diversity or unity, you have to make a choice. There is a very sad way of achieving unity in human anthropology, which is scapegoating. You take a group, whether they're innocent or guilty, it doesn't matter, you just put all the blame on them and then execute them. 
And France, sadly enough, has a very dark history of scapegoating minorities to create its unity. There is the Dreyfus, l'affaire Dreyfus in 1894, where a Jewish officer was degraded, uh, deprived of his military orders under false accusations just because he was Jewish. Another dark page of French history, uh, that's the massacre of uh, Aigues So Italian workers were hired by a French fac uh, salt mine to work there. What did the French do? They met them with picks and axes, and something between eight and 150 Italians were killed. And that's not the worst part of the story. The worst part of the story is that the murderers were acquitted, and when the jury announced that they were innocent, everyone in the courtroom stood and gave them a standing ovation. So France does have a dark past when it comes to creating unity by singling out and executing the minorities. This leads to, well, what we all remember of French actuality since 2015, the Charlie Hebdo attacks, the Bataclan attacks, the death of Samuel Paty, of Jacques Hamel, and the list keeps going on and on and on. The problem is that nowadays we don't tell the young generation how much blood it costs to create the extremely fragile unity that France has achieved at the moment. You have a minority that believes that all of French evil doing in the colonial era is the cause for everything that is wrong now. Well, France has been violent long before the colonial period, so you can't reduce everything to the ultra-contemporary history. We need to have some uh, distance and perspective. So how does one ensure that the next generation does not repeat these horrible histories? I think France has a problem with one religion? No, she won't say that. Oh, no, no. Ooh. No, it's the hardcore republicanism. It's a religion that sets the state as the highest standard, as the norm for decreeing what is transcendental and what is not. And of course, everyone will be frustrated with that, especially when your motto is liberté, égalité, fraternité, but no one is free, no one is equal, and there is no sense of community and brotherhood. So how do we use this figure of Marianne to recreate, to reinvent a shared national identity? I think we should perhaps redefine what liberté, égalité, fraternité means. Liberté, freedom, for what? For achieving happiness. You love the place where you are happy. If you feel trapped in a place where you are unhappy, <coughs> you'll end up not liking it. So there are serious economic problems that lead to a feeling of stagnation all across the French society that have to be addressed. Egalité. I don't believe much in equality. I'm ready to fight physically against any man in the room who tells me that men and women are equal. Um, it's just not a thing as an absolute. Equality is relative. Equality is the equality in front of the law. So double standards can't really work under that regime, but the only way you can stop having double standards is by having a one single standard on many things. You can't expect people to just come along with a different set of norms and try to navigate all of that or to repress any form of uh, strangeness or diversity. And now, fraternité. Well, we used to have a way of creating fraternité by fighting against other people. You know, aux armes citoyens. Uh, so let's, let's shed lots of blood and then we'll be united. Perhaps there's a better way of creating this sense of fraternité, of brotherhood, by seeing the nation as a place towards which we have a debt, a place to which we owe something. So I have four suggestions for achieving that. This one, libraries, that's the Bibliothèque Saint Geneviève. Believe it or not, in France, it's rather easy to get a library card to work in this environment. This is where you can receive and transmit the knowledge that history is not just what happened over the last 60 years. 
and history is full of people who have given their blood, who have given their time, energy, and creativity to entrust us with beauty. France has this immense cultural heritage linked to Catholic Christian history. You could ask any Muslim in France, they're more, well, they're happier with cathedrals than with hardcore secularism. People who share a religion, a faith in something transcendent, have more in common than with people who want to eradicate any form of religious feeling except for the one true state. So, another thing, the love of the land, le terroir, as we say in, fr in France, we live in a society where the food we eat doesn't have much connection with the land where we live. And C.S. Lewis had that beautiful phrase saying that because we don't eat the fruit of the land, we import things from all around the planet, the strength of the hills is not with us. If you know that the food you eat costs the time and energy of your neighbor, of another citizen, then you have this sense of unity. And finally, family, intergenerational families that can pass on and transmit the sense of belonging to one place that people might love and want to die for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Why did, um, why did France lose its soft power? Because, well, I, I think the economic factor was at play here. Uh, I'll say it, I won't say it very loud, it's because of the EU as well. That it, in this power dynamic with Germany, France has lost a lot of its shining power, while Germany didn't gain more soft power either. And of course, the United States has engineered a way of influencing shared culture in such a way that, you know, my students ask me, what kind of TV show can I watch to improve my French? Because, you know, I tell them that's how I improve my English. I don't have any, anything <laughs> to advise them to watch. I don't know. Just ask people your age, maybe they'd know. But there is no um, cultural production that shows what the country can offer and there's just a general sense of disillusionment. People don't love the place anymore.